Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the um, CBA Working Group of Democratizing Power panel event today. Um, so today we will be having a discussion around empower, empower the immigrant and the youth um, community here in San Diego. So I would like to introduce the panelists. Folks, would you um, please announce to you? Um, I would ask you to offer your name, your pronoun, and your organization. So my name is Jean Wee, pronoun he, him, his with CBI. I'll pass it on to Blake. Hi, everyone. My name is Blake Hopstead. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm with Parent Voices San Diego. Uh, I'll pass it to Ana Laura. Hi, everyone. This is Ana Laura. She, her, ella, and our policy initiatives. Passing it to Erin. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Erin Wilson Nieves, pronoun she, her, hers, and I'm with Alliance San Diego, and I will pass it off to Janika. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janika Faulkner. I am a civic engagement organizer at Alliance San Diego. I go by she, her, hers. I will pass it on to Warson. Thanks, Janika. Hi everyone, my name is Warson, pronouns she, her, hers. I am with Youth Will and I'm gonna pass it to Sydney. Thank you, um, my name's Sydney, pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am with Youth Will, and I will pass it to Precious. Hello everyone, my name is Precious Letchaw. I'm with Youth Will, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I will pass it on to... Uh, yeah, I can go. Okay. Um, I think I'm the last one. My name is Chara Pina. I am a re researcher at Center on Policy Initiatives. Um, my pronouns are uh, she, her, hers. Uh, we also have Ita. Okay, so before we can kick up this, this event, um, we have a little quiz for you guys. So the question going to be, um, how much money does the city spend every year? So um, we're going to launch a poll right now, and hopefully you're going to get, you know, have some fun picking, guessing the answer. Okay, about half of you already voted. Let's give it another five seconds and I'm gonna end the poll. Do, 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 do. Okay, we're gonna end the poll. Well, the fun part is you won't get to know the answer until the end of this, this event. And there's a reason why. So we be patient with us. In the meantime, um, I'm gonna introduce the first panel, um, Preston and Sydney, uh, Youth Will, they're gonna do their presentation around youth opportunity. Awesome. Is it one of us that are sharing our screen? Hello, um, my name is Precious. Um, oh, if you want to go to the next slide. Me and Sydney are here today as Youth Will, uh, showing up representing representing uh, Youth Will. My name is Precious and I am Emergency Resource Ambassador with Youth Will and I'll pass it on to Sydney. Thank you, Precious. Um, if you could go to the, the next slide. 
Um, my name is Sydney. I'm a resource ambassador at Youth Will. Um, and Precious, you're doing the intro, right? Yes, so Youth Will uh, is a community nonprofit that is centering um, our goals around supporting youth and making sure that young people, uh, making sure young people have a future where we have what we need to be happy happy and healthy to reach our full potential. And so our mission is to build youth power, improve youth development, and demand youth prioritization. And if you would go to the next slide. And so I'll, I'll be talking, yeah. I'll be talking about the um, Office of Child and Youth Success. Um, so the Office of Child and Youth Success would most importantly create um, or ensure that youth have a space and a voice in the city of San Diego. Um, the office would provide linkages across already existing functions. So San Diego has many resources and boards and organizations that exist for youth and their families. Uh, the office would create links across those existing functions in order to better serve and to have all of those resources available to find in one place. Um, in regards to funding, having an Office of Child and Youth Success would create a centralized area to better ask for and receive funding for youth programs and projects. Um, and then the office would also encourage collaboration and connection between these resources that exist in order to reach set goals. So for example, um, city collaborating with local schools and organizations to better serve youth um, and some of the potential goals um, that we have in mind while creating the Office of Child and Youth Success are to integrate child, youth, and family-friendly planning practices in alignment with UNICEF's child family uh, city standards, center voices of children and youth in decisions that directly impact them, and then facilitate changes in policies. Uh, we are asking for $350,000 for the office, um, and it does already exist in various forms in most major cities across the country, and it has been successful. Um, in order to keep the office accountable, we believe that the office should be advised by a commission for children, youth, and their families, which will include youth members, parents of young children, and youth serving businesses and nonprofit organizations, including child care providers. And uh, we also believe there should be intentional recruitment from historically under-resourced neighborhoods um, and Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, so why is um, this important? So first of all, it's important to youth. Um, it would center youth, youth voice. Um, and it would also create employment for youth. So it can be very challenging and very scary being um, youth, especially transitional age youth when a lot of things in your life are changing. Um, you know, for me, it was housing insecurity um, and employment insecurity. For some youth, it's immigration or it's food insecurity. Um, and especially for transitional age youth, it's easy to feel like you're alone and you're not supported. Um, and we are, you know, valued members of the community and we you know, deserve to have a voice in the city and to have a space that represents us and prioritizes um, our success um, and our future. Um, and it's not only important to just youth, it's important to our community. Um, this office would ensure that San Diego is a family-friendly city. Um, families are right now choosing not to raise families um, in the city of San Diego. Um, the birth rate plummeted. Um, 36% from 18 to 11.6 in central San Diego from 2000 to 2019, as compared to 27% in the county as a whole. Um, and the benefits to the community um, would be a lot. It would increase access to affordable childcare. It would improve family physical and mental health, reduce family and youth housing insecurity, as well as food insecurity. Um, and I will pass it, pass it to Precious. 
Thank you, Sydney. And if we go to the next slide, we will be reviewing another thing that we're advocating for. So the Youth Environmental Score is something we're advocating for at Youth Will, which will, which will be something that we hope to be prioritized in the city budget. This program would focus on opportunities for our opportunity and low income youth. When I say opportunity youth or youth disconnection, I mean young people 16 to 24 that are neither in school nor working. And so youth disconnection has always been at an all time high, but with the pandemic and youth physically disconnected from schools, also the unemployment rate being high, the highest it's been since the Great Depression young people have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So according to the San Diego Workforce Partnership statistics, San Diego County overall has a youth disconnection rate of 9.2%, which means that roughly 30, 38,000 opportunity youth reside in San Diego. That's just a little background about that. Um, also, more importantly, uh, African American disconnection, um, youth disconnection is 26% of that 9.2%. That's making one, one, one in every four African American students in our county are neither in school or, nor working. So this program would be a great way to keep young people busy, learning, exercising our skill sets, and a great chance to invest into our youth rather than criminalize young people. So we are, we are recommending that this program goes under the, city, the city's uh, recs and recreational department, and it would include youth employment opportunities and green spaces with environment being a focus that has coming, is coming up in the world right now. We would be able to pay young people to participate in initiatives that would focus on community gardens, green spaces, greenhouses, and so on. And along with that, it will, there will be a focus on youth enrichment and through improving and re, reintroducing um, the funding back into our trainings at libraries, our recreational sports and activities, and our after school programs. We will be supporting young people getting on the track uh, after this pandemic. And last but not least, it will give funding into youth ambassadors like Sydney and myself. We have been employed to, um, to disseminate um, program information, resources and opportunities and making them aware of peer-to-peer -peer outreach. And so those are the three focuses of the Youth Environmental Corps. And if you will go into the next slide, it will, I'll just kind of get into why it's important to our community. So for the community, this would mean that we would be building healthier, safer, and happier communities by, by prioritizing this investment. And it would also ensure an equal access to tutoring, sports, activities, and green areas for low-income families. And it would be really beneficial to our community because we would grow our appreciation um, for our community's natural environment. And it would also give young people a chance to provide, get, get provided with the opportunity to have long-term employment and green economy, maybe that's having that on their resume. And so last but not least, um, from a personal perspective, as a young person myself, not growing up with access to green spaces or knowing how to manage them um, means that I now, have an opportunity to have access to working towards a healthier diet, healthier life through environmental stability. And yeah, that is that is the program, that is the Youth Environmental Corps. And if you go to the next slide, it's a, it's a thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yay, thank you, Youth Will, for this. Um, awesome presentation. Um, I will I will ask um, the attendee whatever question that you may have, please go ahead and drop it inside the chat. And then at some, you know, toward the end, we will bring it back up for um, Q and A as well. But let's give a shout out and get hand 
or clapping, silent clap for the youth today, tonight. It's showing up. It, these are, you know, it's pretty amazing to see how they come together and then work on policy. Our future cannot be any brighter than this. Yeah. So next up, I'm going to introduce um, Blake from Parent Voice with the language access. Uh, thanks, John Hui, and, and thanks again, Sydney and Precious, for, for that overview and for, for modeling youth leadership uh, for us as well. I appreciate both of you. Um, so so I'm, uh, my name again is, is Blake Hofstead. My, my pronouns are he, him, his from Parent Voices San Diego. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about language access in the city of San Diego. It's, it's a really important issue, but I don't think it's one that we talk about very often, you know, we don't rank it up there with um, with other priorities as, as being as important. But San Diego, especially being where it is situated uh, 15 miles from the border, um, a home to, to people from dozens of different countries around the world and, and hundreds of different native languages. Uh, it, we should really be focusing more on how our city can can be more accessible and more equitable. Um, for folks who are non-English speakers. So, um, John, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the, the slide deck and, and we'll talk a little bit more. Um, so here's just some data on, it, this is, you know, the technical term, li limited English proficiency speakers in San Diego. Um, so this would be people who either don't identify as speaking English as, at all, or identify as speaking very little English um, with the first language that they're much more comfortable in. Um, as you can see, we have literally thousands of limited English speakers in every city council district, most predominantly district eight, district nine, um, but you know, well over 5,000 in most council districts. This adds up to nearly 100,000 people in the city of San Diego that speak a language other than English. Um, that's a lot. That's 100,000 people who we, by, by not investing in language access have effectively said, we're, we're not concerned with your ability to, to participate in civic processes because we have not done the work um, to allow you to do so. Uh, and, and I just like to share this. It's, it's important to know those numbers. We can kind of, we kind of know that we have a lot of non-English speakers, but it's important to know just how many. Uh, so we can go to the next side, next slide. All right, and it doesn't have to be this way. Um, I, I put this slide here to, to know that there is a path to supporting folks who speak another language and it's uh, you're comparing with another city in, in California. So in San Francisco, um, about 20 years ago, they passed an equal access to services ordinance in 2001. Um, and what this means is they, that was a commitment that the city of San Francisco was making to ensure that all city offices and departments were accessible to everyone in the city, regardless of the language that they spoke. Um, and this was amended to more specifically focus on language access in 2009. So San Francisco has an Office of Civic Engagement and Immigrant Affairs. Um, and I, I really appreciate how those two areas, uh, which may seem different on paper, but I appreciate how those are blended together under one office. Um, to ensure that people who are working on immigrant affairs are also using that lens that our immigrant communities and our non-English speaking communities deserve to have access to civic engagement. Um, and so they oversee a really comprehensive citywide language access program. Every single city department in San Francisco has a language access liaison. Uh, so if I'm an employee at the Parks and Rec Department and, and I want to um, you know, let's say we're having a rec council meeting and I want to make sure that the people in my community can participate. I can reach out to my department language access liaison and they can ensure that I have interpretation for the members of my community that need it, regardless of their native language at my meeting. Um, and just to, to kind of contextualize, that's 
that office, that, that program accounts for $16 million in language access spending. And San Francisco's, you know, we think of it as being a big city, um, but it's way smaller than San Diego. It has way fewer people than San Diego. Um, so San Francisco spends about $18, a little more than $18 a person on language access um, and, and dedicated language access funding. San Diego is very different. Um, in 2019, we were, you know, we, we were lucky to win. Um, I, I shouldn't say lucky. A lot of groups came together and fought for and won uh, $50,000 in the budget to support interpretation at community planning groups. However, a lot of community planning groups around the city didn't take advantage of that. There wasn't a lot of outreach around the program. Um, and so implementation was really dependent on those community planning groups doing the work and getting the interpretation. And they were able to do it. You know, we've heard from community planning groups in other parts of the city um, that, that did, uh, that were able to provide interpretation at their meetings. Um, however, we're in, in Linda Vista, we didn't do that you know, and, and that's for a variety of different reasons, but uh, the community members in our neighborhood uh, did not have access to that, um, to that interpretation, even though the city funded it. Um, and it's because there wasn't a really sustained outreach effort. Um, if a non-English speaker calls in to a city council meeting, we're, again, we're lucky to have a city clerk employee who speaks Spanish, who is called upon to provide interpretation at, at city council meetings. And I I really am grateful that she's there to do that, um, because if she wasn't, if she wasn't willing to give her time, um, you know, Spanish speaking people of which there are tens of thousands in the city would not be able to provide testimony at city council meetings. They would not be able to add their voice to our civic processes. And that's just for Spanish speakers. We have over 20,000 Vietnamese speakers in San Diego. We have over 20,000 Tagalog speakers in San Diego. We have over 10,000, you know, Arabic and Somali speakers in San Diego. And if they call into a city council meeting, they'll be unable to participate and provide public comment in these ways. And so in terms of dedicated funding, San Diego spends that $50,000 um, for intentional funding for language access for community planning groups. Um, for a city, we have over 500,000 more people than San Francisco. So we spend less than four cents a person on language access in San Diego. Um, and if we go to the next slide, there's just another way to, to visualize what that looks like. Oh, I'm so, is that other graph in there, Zhang Hui, do you know? If not, I can share my screen as well uh, real quickly to show that. Just let me know. Uh, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I just, hold on. I just shared it again. Okay. There. Okay, great. I, I really like to visualize data because numbers are sometimes, you know, not as effective. And so if, if y'all might, you might have to squint, um, but this is just a way to visualize the disparity in that language access spending by city. Um, San Francisco, over 16 million, San Diego, if you have good eyesight, might be able to see a sliver um, in the bar there. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate. And I, I think that um, when we look at things, we contextualize it in this way, it shows that we have a lot of growth um, to make in making our city more accessible for non-English speakers, especially considering that there are over 100,000 of them in our city. Uh, we can go to the next slide too. So what should we do about it? So uh, this is why I'm, I'm hoping many of you are here tonight is to learn about what you can do. Um, and so what we're, we're prioritizing this year, you know, we can't accomplish this all in one year and even a city like San Francisco, um, they've achieved that level of funding because they've made a 20 year commitment. So this is not a 2022, we're done and we can go home. Um, but to start, uh, we'd like to see a citywide district by district linguistic diversity study. I think it would be really important for city staff, both in city council offices and, and different departments to know exactly um, what is the linguistic diversity makeup of their community. You know, again, we kind of have ideas. I mean, I know in Linda Vista, we have a lot of Spanish speakers, a lot of Vietnamese speakers and a lot of Tagalog speakers. 
But some of those lesser known languages, we're not exactly sure um, how many community members speak those languages. Um, we know that there are over 20 different native languages spoken in Linda Vista, but we don't know exactly the extent of it, you know, so it, that would help guide city, both city council members to provide targeted outreach to their communities and city staff the same. Um, we'd also like to see funding to translate city agendas, <clears throat> any type of public communications and press releases to make that information more accessible to community members um, and provide subtitles for city council meetings. Uh, which is, is not perfect from an accessibility standpoint, but it's a start. Um, so we'll, we'll have one of our community members speak about that in a second. Um, this, is a, this is an idea that came, there's many uh, cities around the country that do this, Houston and Atlanta are two examples, um, but hiring, and con hiring or contracting interpreters and distributing multilingual cards. So if I'm a city resident and I need, an, I need live interpretation in the moment, there's these cards that are distributed in different places in the city, libraries, recreation centers, um, and I can call and get live interpretation in the moment so that my needs are addressed. Um, and then continue to support that ongoing uh, allocation of $50,000 for community planning groups and, and ensure that if $50,000 is not being spent on interpretation, that that money is then spent on outreach and, and building those connections so that we, we really need to build a culture of language access in San Diego. It's not just gonna materialize because we provide funding. Um, we need to change our way of doing business so that planning groups, it's, it's embedded into their routine. You know, interpretation is just how we do business. Um, and we're ensuring that those, those forums, which are important local decision-making forums are, are open to non-English speakers. Um, so that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Itan Dewi Jimenez. She's a community member from Linda Vista. And um, Itan Dewi is going to share a little bit more about her experience um, as it relates to language access. So Itan Dewi, if you want to, si, si quiere uh, presentar, and then I'll be interpreting for, for Itan Dewi uh, as, she, as she shares. Uh, hola a todos. Mi nombre es Itan Dewi Jimenez y soy de la comunidad de Linda Vista. Uh, so this is Itan Dewi Jimenez, and she's from Linda Vista. Uh, querías con, quería contarles mi experiencia cuando he querido dar mi opinión en el, uh, para dar un comentario en el City Council, y normalmente nunca tienen personas disponibles. A veces tardo horas, bueno, no horas, 20 minutos esperando que alguien venga y traduzca. So when Itan Dewi has wanted to provide her opinion at city council meetings in the past, it's very rare that someone is immediately on hand to interpret. Um, so in addition to waiting on the line to provide her comment, she sometimes has waited up to 20 minutes for the city to locate someone who's able to interpret her comment. Otra cosa también que después de que dan sus resultados de los votos, de los votos finales, no, no sabemos los resultados porque no está en nuestro idioma, no lo dan en nuestro idioma. So in addition to waiting for interpretation, when the city council is finally voting or discussing, um, people like Itan Dewi who wait to give their comment aren't able to understand the discussion and aren't able to know the results of the vote. So they don't know how effective their comment even is. La necesidad de tener traducción en, es importante en, en la vida de cada día porque otro ejemplo es donde soy voluntaria, uh, están llegando muchos, muchas personas que no hablan el idioma que, que se habla aquí en Estados Unidos. So, in addition to just city council access, she is a, a volunteer at an organization that receives a lot of people who do not speak English. Um, and it makes it more difficult for them to get services if they don't speak, you know, the, the don't speak English, the language that, you know, is most commonly spoken in the United States. En un, en un día normal recibimos 25 clientes que de esas 25, 20 son, uh, solo hablan otro idioma. So in a given day, she might work with 25 clients and of those 25, 20 of them are non-English speakers. Y no solamente hablan español, hay otros uh, idiomas que se necesitan traducción, que si un traductor no estuviera ahí, 
uh, la gente no sería escuchada de lo que necesita. And it's not just Spanish. There's people with many different native languages. And if so, there's, if there's no translator there, um, those people just aren't able to access services. También en mi comunidad hay mucha gente um, en Linda Vista que habla otros idiomas, como por ejemplo Mixteco, que ni siquiera hablan español, no saben sus derechos, no saben ni llenar papeles porque no hay nadie que los ayude con la interpretación. So we often think about, uh, so in Linda Vista, there's many community members from the Mixteco community and indigenous community from Mexico who, in addition to not speaking English, don't speak Spanish either. Um, and it's almost impossible to, to get resources. They can't fill out paperwork. Paperwork doesn't come in Mixteco. Um, and it's, it's extremely challenging for them to access services and resources. Y son las personas más impactadas ahorita por el momento por la pandemia que hay. Hay recursos para renta. Sí, hay recursos para ayudar para utilidades. Pero no saben que existe porque las dan en inglés. So these are the people that are most impacted by the pandemic as well. And, you know, Itan Dewey's mentioned there's, we know that there are programs for rental assistance and utilities assistance, but if those programs are not communicated in languages that people understand, they go underutilized. Y por eso les pido su apoyo, su, por favor, que apoyen a nuestro acceso lingüístico. Más que nada, hay mucha gente nueva viniendo ahorita en estos momentos de otros lugares que necesitan entender que tienen derechos. So for these reasons, she's asking for everyone's support that we really prioritize language access so that people who are, you know, recently arriving to this country or people who have been here who, who don't speak English have, have equitable access. Uh, muchas gracias por escucharme y aquí estaré escuchando la información que vayan a dar. So thanks for listening um, and she'll be here listening as well. Uh, Jean, we, I'll, I'll pass it over to you for the for the next uh, next piece. Yes, thank you, Blake, and um, Ethan, and we for uh, speaking. And I really applaud you, the community member, to show up and 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 place the emphasis on the importance of language access. Sometime in the midst of doing the work that we do, and we just don't often pause and. Um, take the time and then ensure that everybody have a seat at the table in the middle, you know, um, also at a conversation as well. So mm -hmm. I appreciate for that reminder and um, everyone patient to listening in as well. So next up, I want to introduce the, um, I mean, I want to introduce Aaron Wilson Neves of Alliance San Diego. Thank you, Jean Wee, um, and thank you for everyone who's gone. Um, so my name is Aaron Wilson Nieves. I am the Civic Engagement Manager at Alliance San Diego. Um, we are a community engagement nonprofit. Um, we've been around for 11 years, and I've worked there for eight of those 11 years. <laughs> um, and I am here to talk to you today about the Office of Race and Equity. Um, so Jean, will you can go ahead and share that first slide for me? Great. So the Office of Race and Equity um, was brought was an idea that was brought on by um, City Council City Council Member Monica Montgomery Step, um, and was passed last year. Um, it was it was created um, after or during uh, a time when our city was having several protests, a time where it was very visual that people within um, our underserved communities were being oppressed, suppressed, and attacked. Um, and so council member Monica Montgomery step brought this forward and it was created to educate and provide perspective to city staff law enforcement and elected officials on race equity. And what is race equity race equity is when race no longer determines one socioeconomic outcomes um, when everyone has what they need to thrive, no matter where they live and the idea is to which is achieved when. The people that are most impacted by structural inequity, racial inequity, um, are meaningfully involved in the creation and implementation of um, policies and practices that will impact their lives, our lives. 
right? Um, and so the goal of this office is for all city employees to recognize and combat systemic bias in their daily work for the residents of <clears throat> San Diego. Um, so there are some main goals that the ORE has, and that is to provide quality public service, work in partnership with all of our communities to achieve safe and livable neighborhoods, and create and sustain resilient and economically proper, prosperous um, city um, that has an opportunity for every community. So no matter where you live, you will be able to thrive within San Diego. Um, how, how is that going to be achieved? So the ORE, Office of Race and Equity, is going to inform uh, things like hiring practices and contracting within the city, um, distribution of resources and access, environmental justice, restorative justice, um, policing and over-policing, and really several other departments um, that are in the city to make sure that there is equitable treatment for the communities that have been long overlooked um, when it comes to fair treatment. Um, so just to give off a, a few examples of some things that the ORE can work on, um, and that is potentially having a citywide and equity assessment, you know, based on economy, housing, education, and policing. And as you all, if you've attended, you know, some of our events, we talk about all of these issues um, within our budget summary. And really this office can really do assessments to see where we are with those within our city. Um, and, you know, it can also address, I don't know if you all saw, but there was a study released, um, I think like March, so in the past few days, um, that addressed the extreme pay gaps that we have here in San Diego, right? And some of those pay gaps are based on race. And so this is something that this office can um, assess and really utilize the community to to really address some of these issues and why it's happening within our city. And John, we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so CBA, we have a couple of asks um, in regards to the ORE, and that is that Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities are continuously involved in dialogue for the ORE. Um, we believe that if these folks, if our folks, our communities are not involved in the dialogue, then the office, you know, will not have a true vision of what is happening to folks within our community. Um, we want to make sure that there are some listening, at least two listening sessions that will be hosted um, by city council in each district that will really open up, you know, an opportunity for people within our communities to use their voice and share what's happening with them in our communities. Um, and, and these really need to happen, you know, with enough time for the changes that the community wants to be implemented. Um, and we also want a particip participatory um, budget plan for the community equity fund. And what is the community equity fund? So um, that is um, the city government partnering with organizations to create sustainable and recurring funding sources. Um, and the fund could be utilized to invest in job opportunities and training um, in underserved communities that could go directly through city mentorship and internship programs. Um, <clears throat> and we believe that, and also the council member Monica Montgomery Stepp believes that this will address barriers often created for the community um, and organizations that are closest to the people who need the most help. Um, and our community organizations, you know, are successful in the work that we do. We are often successful, um, and that's even on limited resources. So imagine what we could do if, you know, we were funded to, you know, provide some of these programs that our communities are in dire need of. And, you know, lastly, I want to talk about the fact that this, the Office of Race and Equity is, is not a new idea. There are other cities, other communities um, that have instituted an office of race and equity. There's one in Pittsburgh, um, there's one in Portland, Seattle, um, and Charlottesville, Virginia. And so there, this is not new, but it's also something that is up and coming. And we wanna make sure we wanna be a leading example of what it should look like within our city. And, and I believe we are going to be doing that. Um, with this ask, with these asks, we're not, adding any additional revenue that was not fitted to already um, be funded for the ORE. 
Um, and, I, and I truly believe, and we truly believe things are moving forward um, as the a job posting was posted today for to hire an executive director for this office. Um, so I appreciate you all listening to me and, and kind of getting a better understanding for what the ORE is um, fitted to do. And I hope that we can gain your support um, moving forward. And I will pass it back to Jean Wee. Thank you, um, Kira. Yeah, so um, now we're going to invite everyone. We're going to do uh, an activity um, to get folks engaged and, and really talking about these issues um, and participating with each other. So um, you can pick an issue to talk about. Um, we're going to have breakout rooms, and you can choose which room you would like to go into. One will be covering youth power, um, another language access, um, and then uh, race and equity. Thank you for the attendee to participate in this exercise of the breakout room. I know it's not a typical panel event because it's like you're literally part of the event because this is democracy and democracy mean involve everyone in the part of the conversation. And also democracy is very messy as well. It means that you hear all kind of thing happening tonight, like tech here, tech there, moving pieces and all the stuff is super complicated, but that is okay because democracy doesn't leave anybody behind. And so um, the next part is, I hope you guys had a really powerful conversation in your breakout room. And we're gonna ask you to like dedicate somebody from your breakout room to step up and talk about your experience and um, like anything that you wanna share to the rest of us. So for my working group, I'm gonna call on Anna Benita. She um, is an organizer and she speaks only Spanish. So again, Anna, please share what you told us at the breakout room. Anna, te están pidiendo que si puedes compañera, compartir lo que ofreciste en el grupo donde estu estuvimos ahorita las ideas que, que manifestaste. ¿Cuáles son? Y yo te traduzco con mucho gusto. Bueno, de las ideas que manifesté, que sí es necesario que nosotros este, tengamos el acceso al español. Sí, señor. Porque eso sería para este, a, apoyarnos más y que nos entendieran mejor y nosotros de, de una manera vivir mejor. Que sería... Sí. Algo suculento, un banquete especial para todos porque nos comeríamos el mejor platillo. Uh, oh, también dije de... de, de también déjeme, traducir esa parte, déjeme traducir esa parte si no se me olvida. She wants to say that, uh, that by uh, communicating more effectively between us as a community, cooperating and collaborating to resolve problems, that we could actually move forward a lot more. And not, it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street. But also that's very important here. She says that by allowing us in, that the community in general will be eating very good Mexican food. Siga, sigan. Yo te también, también puse de ejemplo como lo que nos pasó ayer con una uh, señora que me habló por teléfono, que le hablaron de Yewis, de los, la organización de los judíos, que, este, que si necesitaba ayuda financiera. La señora como habla mixteco, este, no entendió que era ayuda financiera. Entonces les dijo ella espantada que no, pero le dijo después como que entendió el que le decían algo de la renta, eh, pero ella dijo que no. Pero después como que di, volvió como que a pensar que qué le podían decir. Entonces me habla por teléfono y me dice que le habían ofrecido ayuda financiera, pero que ella dijo que no. Eh, le dije sí era para que te ayudaran para lo de tu renta, pero este le regresó la llamada y ya no pudo volver a tener acceso a la llamada, entonces dije, pues déjame ver con qué persona poder ayudarte a hablar en estos momentos para que le vuelvan a regresar la llamada, porque ese es uno de los problemas que tenemos en Linda Vista, que muchas personas hablan en mixteco y no entienden a veces el lenguaje o las palabras, el significado de las palabras. Ok, uh, déjame explicar eso. She says she's a community organizer in Linda Vista, and she says that uh, she got a call from uh, somebody in the community that said they were very scared because a, a Jewish organization, she forgot the name of it, called them and said, uh, was offering some financial assistance they didn't understand. They just thought it was somebody trying to collect some money. 
So they said no. And then, uh, but they heard the word rent. And when they called her, Anna, they found out, yeah, that organization is helping out with some assistance for rent. But then it was too late because she'd already denied it. So the, the question is, there's a lot of uh, people in Linda Vista community, for example, they're not, not just Spanish. Some people don't speak, uh, excuse me, not just, they're just uh, speak, they're mistakeful speakers. So they don't speak Spanish even. So they don't speak English. They don't speak Spanish. They speak Mixteco, an indigenous language in Mexico. So the, the need for language uh, uh, participation is very important for organizers, community organizers. Thank you, Anna. So um, next up, I'm gonna ask the language access number, room number one, can you offer somebody to speak? Yeah, we're gonna have Adina uh, sharing out from our group. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, we had a, a little bit smaller of a conversation, but I know one of the things that we kind of all talked about was how like we've we've been in different parts of like the city council and community or city access points and have noticed that there's a complete lack of language availability and translation services available for people. Um, I mean, I even just most recently was like sitting in a city council meeting over Zoom and I'm in a, I've been in multiple organizer led uh, sessions where they have closed captioning in Spanish language translation services and these are not-for-profit organizations that can organize these sort of things and yet our own city council does not have that kind of access available for people uh, and so there was mostly a lot of conversation about how like these sort of things should be much more default than they are and they're more default in these organized spaces but not so much in our city council um, and also just discussing how the uh, the lack of availability of those like resources and documents and stuff in a language that is the first language for people makes it very difficult for them to have access to those trans to those services that are important for making living easier and happier. Thank you, Adina. Um, next up, we're going to call on the youth power group number one. Can you please offer somebody to share with the rest of us? Yes, so we had one person that really wanted to share. They didn't get a chance to stay, but they wanted to make sure that what they said was heard. Um, so I just wanted to like speak in regards to things that they asked. And um, they they said that it was really, they thought the youth environment support was really cool because as a person that was coming from a green economy um, background and just like working in environmental um uh, initiatives, they they thought it was really awesome that young people were getting an opportunity to start now and explore that pathway. And um, our volunteer was Kurt. Yes, thanks, Precious. Um, my name's Kurt. Um, I was able to share a small story about my brother who uh, you know, made it onto the job market in when the economy crashed in 2008. And so he wasn't able to find a job uh, for two to three years um, with the economy being as it was. And um, not only that, but that also impacted his mental health during that time. And so um, definitely I wanted to uplift the programs that um, Youth Will has put forward because, um, you know, that's not a, an exception, sort of an exceptional story. Definitely def, um, youth are always, um, there's always gonna be people who are gonna be having difficulty trying to find jobs and that, you know, just, or, or having other difficulties in their lives. And that's just gonna contribute to um, how they begin to participate in society. So having um, programs to support our youth is definitely going to, can only strengthen our society. Thank you, Kurt. So next up, I'm gonna call on the group number two for the youth power. Thanks, Charlie. Unfortunately, we ran out of time as we were about to hit somebody. Um, I don't know if anyone from my team would like to say anything. If not, I can share out because we had some great discussion. Okay. Um, yeah, so we talked about um, some of the things that came out in our group was um, but when it comes to the Office of Child and Youth Success, um, a lot of uh, uh, the idea of mentoring um, came up a few times. So um, adults mentoring young people, specifically when it comes to like careers, um, to help them support um, to go into the workforce. 
Um, some people talked about like big brother, little brother, big sister, little sister. I feel like I'm saying that wrong, but like kind of mentoring um, program um, where um, young people like mentor or like peer to peer mentorship. Um, and then also something that came up um, a few times was like centering youth voice and ma making sure that young people are like employed in this office and also youth voice and youth input is valued. And then when it comes to, um, there's another thing that, oh, when it comes to um, something that was actually re really interesting was when it comes to youth environmental core, somebody said maybe what is it called each office can share or each office within the city of San Diego has can have like a youth employee um, as part of their staff, like each office is required to have a youth employee, which I thought was really interesting. But we had some great discussion. Thanks, shall we? Thank you. Lastly, we're going to call on anybody from the race and equity group. Hey, everyone. So I'm going to be reporting back for uh, the ORE breakout group. Um, one of the questions we had something, what is something that you would like to see addressed within ORE? Um, one thing was budget analysis within your the neighborhoods that we are assessing. Second is the over ticketing of the folks and how we can prevent that from occurring, not just doing an action after they are ticketed multiple times, but preventing them from being ticketed multiple, multiple times. Um, second, what does a, a perfect fully functioning RE program look like? It is making sure, um, well, the opinions were making sure everyone is housed uh, and then piggybacked off that is just racial and just racial, racial justice, a racial justice issue. I'm sorry, racial justice issue, um, including the unhoused folks. We see that it's five times national average of unhoused folks out here of the BIPOC community. And then secondly is closing the pay gap whether that be uh, sex, race, within the admin uh, admin jobs. And that is all. Thank you, Janika. Um, so are you getting ready to find out about the result of the two polls that you did earlier? Are you excited? You want to know the answer? I know it. If you are, just start singing like the Jeopardy song. Do, 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 do. All right. So the first question is how much money does the city spend every year? And the answer is $4 billion. Holy moly. Could you believe it? That's a lot of money, right? All right. So the next question is how much money? Oh. I haven't even started with the second poll. So the second poll is how much money all of our demand caught together in the first year. So you guys get to guess now. This is only referring to the democratizing power of things that we covered today. Language access, ORE, youth empowerment. Okay, another five seconds. We're going to stop the poll. And so this is your result. A lot of you were saying how, okay. It's split half and half. Six of you said let them have a million, four of you say a million, and then four say 1.5, 1.5 million, and one of you say two, and then the other five say three million. Are you ready to see what the 
what the result is. 1.5 million. Wow. Okay. So the question next for you guys is 1.5 million out of $4 billion. What is that percentage? Anybody can do math really quick? No. Okay, neither do I. I use a U calculator, but fortunately we have calculator for, you know, to prep during the presentation. So it is 0.03% of the CD budget. Okay, right, let's pause for a second and take that in. All of our demand for tonight is only a fraction of the seed budget. I want you to soak that in for a second, right? We're not asking for a lot and the CD should be able to fund for this. I want you to feel that. I want you to feel that a little bit because we're gonna take some action around it because we should and we should demand for this. So I'm gonna bring up Blake talking about the importing of engagement and participation. Thanks, John Wee, and thanks for framing it in that context, like we're asking for dust, you know, budget dust, just whatever is left over. So um, real quickly, before we get to our action, just want to further contextualize civic engagement. Um, so we have a couple of slides to share that, um, that will kind of help make that point. All right. It's appearing a little funky on the screen. Do you see it? Or I, you want I, me to reshare it? Yeah, it, it just wasn't like we couldn't see the whole thing. It was like the top half. Okay, there. There you go. All right. So we from from the time that we're young, we're really we're really indoctrinated into believing that voting is like the most important thing. That's how our voices are heard civically. And while there is truth to that, um, voting is one tool in our civic toolkit to be able to ensure that our voices are heard by our elected officials. So just wanted to kind of put that into context. Here are the results from the 2016 mayoral election. <clears throat> there were three candidates uh, Kevin Faulkner got over 50% in the primary election in June, and so therefore was elected mayor of San Diego by 180,000 people. So that seems like a big number, 180,000, and it is. Um, but if we go to the next slide, let's uh, we'll contextualize what that really means. All right, <clears throat> so of registered voters in the 2016 election, you think, oh, Kevin Faulkner won, he's probably yellow. No, the yellow is people who didn't vote, who were registered to vote, but who did not vote. Over 50%. Kevin Faulkner got barely over 25% <clears throat> of the vote of registered voters. And this is not to make a political argument one way or another, right? It's just to say that 25% of registered voters chose the mayor of San Diego in 2016. That's crazy, right? So even though this person was elected to lead our city, he was elected with a mandate of a quarter of registered voters. So yes, he won the election, but do, do we really know 100% is he going to be acting in our best interest all the time? Should we just accept that? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here is another graph that shows it by total population. Over half the people who live in San Diego are not registered to vote or were not registered to vote in 2016. Now this, to be fair, this also includes kids, babies, you know, like maybe they will we'll wait a little bit to give them the right to vote. Uh, but we also know that many members of our community are not able to register to vote who would want to if they could. Um, these people still live in our city. They still deserve to have a civic voice. You know, 
folks who were formerly incarcerated, um, caught up in the criminal justice system, oftentimes have their voting rights stripped and not restored. Um, people in varying stages of immigration, they're residents of our city. Our city represents them, but they're not able to vote. So Kevin Faulkner was elected mayor by less than 15% of the people who live in our city. You know, that's not, that's not a very big number when we look at it this way. 57% of the vote, less than 15% of the people. Um, let's go to the next slide. So here's most recently. So again, these numbers are a lot bigger. Um, and we'll just, we'll go on to the next slide to, to contextualize it in the interest of time. Um, but even still, Todd Gloria got a lot of votes for mayor, but less than half the people who are registered to vote in the city um, elected him mayor. And a quarter, over a quarter of registered voters did not vote in the 2020 mayoral election. We'll go to the last slide. Oop, one back one more, sorry. And this is just, again, that breakdown. So Todd Gloria won, won the election, but again, less than 25% of our city chooses the mayor when we, when we include people who are not registered to vote. And, and many of them are adults with political opinions who just are not able to register. All right, now we'll go to this final slide. So what does this tell us? The mayor is elected every single year. The mayor is elected with a minority not a majority, a minority of the votes of all registered voters. So it's really important. We don't, we, we cannot make the assumption that elected officials are always going to represent our interests every single day that they're in office. And voting, like I said, it's important. I'm not telling people like, hey, don't vote, <laughs> you know. Um, but we've been conditioned to think of voting as like the way to make our voice heard. And it's a way. It's one way, one of many ways. Um, and especially for people who may not be eligible to vote, voting is not the be all end all of civic participation. It's not the only thing we have at our disposal to participate in the civic process. Um, so as we take what John Hui led us through and knowing that these are demands that we all value, that we all wanna see our city do, we know that our elected officials, we need to push them we can't assume that they're going to do the things that we want them to do. And we have other tools at our disposal to civically engage people. Um, that's what we're about to do. So that's what we're about to do. You're, we're about to break out one of our other tools in our toolkit um, to make sure that our civic priorities are, are included and are being heard at the city level. So I'm going to pass it back off to, to Jean Hui and I, I think um, Janika or whoever's going to lead our next activity. So it's going to be Janika. Cool. Thank you so much, Blake. Uh, that was an amazing way to lead into this. Um, and so I want to start off by saying my name is Janika. I'm with Alliance San Diego. I go by she, her, hers. I'm going to be leading you in the social media bomb that we're doing right now. Uh, this social media bomb is a is a way to show our collective power as a community to hold our city count, council accountable. In the uh, chat, you will see a, a link to this beautiful presentation right here on the screen. And you can, in that, in that link right there, that blue link right there, it will give you instructions on how to email the mayor. It's already preset with Jean, we is showing you right now how to uh, do it through your email. Use these hashtags right here. Okay. Yes, I'm sending an email to the mayor right now. And um, you all should start to do it too. Click yes. send. Do it along with Jean. We see it only took two seconds to send out that that uh, email. Our second option of our social media bomb is to post this beautiful graphic right here with the uh, followed with a personal message and these hashtags right here. This table right here shows the handles or social media handles 
uh, and tags for our mayor and the rest of our city council. We have uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find them at these handles right here. Just post your graphic with a personal message and follow it with those hashtags. You can also download the graphic by holding this down and uh, selecting save. Lastly, uh, join us in this next and join us in our next CBA meeting. You can sign up for the meeting through this link right here. Well, Jean Louis is currently walking you through how to do it on social media. So this link right here, this blue one, will uh, take you to how to sign up to get info on the next CBA meetings and events. Well, uh, thank you so much for having me. Now I will pass it back to jean -Louis. Thank you everyone for um, come and joining us tonight on this special presentation and workshop for with the democratizing power. And I hope that you feel inspired. I hope that you um, see the importance of this work on uh, how these little things that we do um, that really have a long-term effect on empowering our community, specifically our immigrant community and our youth, because these are our future. Um, these people that we live with and we see them every day. So I would, I really hope that you take some action tonight and then also join us on May 5th and May 17th and adding your voice along with us and advocating for the community budget priorities. So um, with that, I would like to say appreciate for y'all showing up tonight. Thank you.